Anyway, um, let's get started with exploring classroom comfort with you three searches. Um, so first of all, I just want to acknowledge that um, this was a collaborative project and so we had um, a lot of co-authors um, for this work um, and some of what I'll present today is from the, um, the work that we did the previous year in 2015 um, with YAPH College as well um, and then the the 2016 work, which is the um, the classroom work um, that the OERC um, seeded, um, that was um, some of the same team and then some new additions because they, they changed class. Um, so just a quick overview of what I'll talk about. Um, I'm just going to go quickly through um, why I think it's really important to have youth participating in energy research and then the focus of our own energy research, which is about fuel poverty or energy poverty. And um, a little bit about what we already knew about youth fuel poverty in New Zealand, which was not very much before we um, started, and then um, how we kind of developed a collaborative process through the 2015 study, um, which set us up for doing the collaborative work um, with the Cool at School pilot study. And um, yeah, discussion at the end. So why do I think we should involve youth in energy research? Um, I mean, I think it's the same reasons that we should involve youth in any research. Um, under the, the UNCRC, the um, Convention of the Rights of the Child, children have a legal right to participate. Um, and it's also empowering and democratic. There's studies to show that for the children that are, or young people that are involved in um, the democratic process and in research, it actually improves their health um, and also it's just fear. <laughs> so, um, and another good reason I think for involving young people in energy research is because, um, you know, energy future studies are obviously about the future and youth are a huge part of that. So, um, I think that if we involve young people in research, then um, they also contribute their own knowledge and deeper understanding than if we ourselves as adults conducted the research on children and youth. And that has certainly been my experience the last couple of years working with young people as well. Um, and thinking about some children specific energy issues, um, we know that children, having the presence of children in the house create particular routines and things that are actually very difficult to change. So um, when we're talking about load shifting, the, the family peak that we get when um, children are picked up or they return home from school and we have you know dinner being cooked and we have washing being done and things, um, that's actually harder to shift than it might be for other households without children. Um, and I think uh, Ben Anderson, if he's already done with you in Dunedin, when I spoke to him, he was still at the demand centre. Um, but he, his recent work um, using time use shows that English parents in full-time work are more likely to do weekday evening laundry. Um, and there's also been other work that has shown that shifting the dishwashing and the laundering is actually really complicated and more complicated than policy people might imagine it was, and particularly for households that have children as well. Um, because, you know, you can imagine school uniforms need to be washed or you've got the outside gear that needs to be dry and ready again for use in the morning. There's really nothing you can do to shift that part of the routine. Um, and if we think about what energy poverty or fuel poverty is, we um, kind of agree with an energy vulnerabilities approach that's been put forward by Buzerowski and um, Petrova and colleagues, um, mostly from University of Manchester. Um, and this is a, a bit broader than the kind of previous 10% um, threshold of needs to spend or required energy spending that Boardman put forward um, much earlier on in the, in the 90s. Um, and so what we mean by that is that a household cannot afford enough energy services, including heating, but also um, cooling is starting to become an important part of that too. 
and that um, it's caused, it's much broader than income poverty. Energy poverty is a specific problem because it's also about building quality. It's about the um, energy efficiency of appliances. In New Zealand especially, it's about the cost of energy and the cost of electricity if we're relying on electric heating a lot of the time, as well as being about income and the needs of the households too. And a little bit, um, you know, about um, the social side of things and behaviours and interactions as well. But, you know, if you've got older people or younger people who are at home for a lot more time than um, working people that are working from outside the home, then they, um, you know, there's just more time that they need heating, more time that they need energy, so it does increase their risk. And why we are um, interested in energy poverty as um, public health researchers, Helen and I, is because it has a huge impact on public health and, and we're seeing more and more evidence of this. Um, and we, we used to think that older people were the most affected, but then um, there's been some work done to say that actually families with children under 18 might be an even larger group at risk. And there's been very, very little research done about youth and child experience of, of fuel poverty. There's been some done about um, families and the impact on families, but there's, there was really very, very little about youth and almost none done with youth or younger children about fuel poverty. Um, so just moving on to some things that I'm pretty sure that everybody who's watching or attending will know, <laughs> just um, that New Zealand is really a prime target for people experiencing fuel poverty, given that we spend a lot of time indoors, our houses are old and cold, we, we usually only heat one room, and um, we don't heat very well at all. Um, and if we think about what before we did the 2015 study, what um, indicators that we had that young people in New Zealand were going to be experiencing fuel poverty. We had a fuel poverty rate of about 25%, a child poverty rate of about 25%. Um, a lot of children living in private rental housing um, and in state housing as well. Um, and we had the information from the Children's Commission study where children actually raised electricity as an issue themselves. Um, and also a study that was done by um, some medical students to show that of the children that were under 15 that were admitted to hospital, um, at least half of them had housing that was colder than the parents preferred and 8% of them had experienced disconnection for late or non-payment, which um, we had to look at this the, compared to the stats at the time and that seemed to be much higher than the national rate, maybe about four times higher than the national rate. We also know that um, um, some of the things that we've been doing to fix fuel poverty really work really well for children um, with the um, warm up New Zealand scheme, um, retrofitting insulation, reducing total hospitalisation rates for all children by 6% it was across everybody. When you looked at just the low income households, you reduced it by 12%, um, reducing um, hospitalisations and private rentals for um, children by 19%. So, you know, it's an extremely useful program and I'm sure you're as disappointed as we are that um, the current plan is to really wind down that scheme when it's by no means um, finished. So um, I'm just going to go quickly over the 2015 study. Um, so we called it COOL, Investigating Youth Energy Poverty in New Zealand. Um, and we, I, we developed a way of working with Waiapika College, which is actually my old um, uh, high school um, that was our in um, and um, so I, I went and did workshops with um, a class that were there and asked them how much they wanted to be involved. We did a national survey of young people and we did some email interviews with young people as well. Um, so this is a picture which is a little dated now and I'm sure they'll be a bit embarrassed about how small they look because two years on, they've all grown up and I think they may even be allowed to not wear their uniforms anymore. Um, and this is just a wee clip that I'm going to try and play and give me a shout if it doesn't work from your end. That's working. research into fuel poverty over a total of six class weeks. 
Each workshop took between one to three weeks, and during each workshop, we were split into multiple groups to split the workload. The first workshop that we did started with Kim explaining fuel poverty and how it may affect New Zealanders. We eventually went on to develop questions for a survey tailored for young people our age. Before we released the survey to other students, we looked for double ups for questions, bugs in the surveys, and any problems that it may have. After being checked over at the final time, it was sent to schools across the country, and we waited for results. In the second workshop around June or July, we were introduced to quantitative analysis and how to analyze data. We tried to use a program called EpiInfo, but unfortunately, we had technological issues, so we had to process the information manually. This actually worked out fine, because it meant we got more hands-on experience. In small groups, we worked with the data to find similarities and answers from different questions. The next day, we learned about qualitative, qualitative analysis, and some of us volunteered to take part in an interview study. In the third and final workshop, around October and November, we began qualitative analysis on the open-ended questions. This involved some small group work. Each group worked, worked with responses to one question and put them into categories called codes. We then chose a quote from each code which represented that category well. We then began work on the speeches and presentations for this year. Okay, so that was a presentation by Kelly that um, was given um, to disseminate the work that we had done. Um, that, so that's, that's in a nutshell what we did and how we did it. Um, and I'll just flick over some of the results from that study too. So we had, um, you know, very, very many um, young people telling us that their house feels cold during the winter. So that was, you know, nearly 80%. Um, also, when the when the heating was in use, we had um, almost two thirds telling us that their home was still sometimes cold, at least. Um, and things that they said about being cold in the winter, um, such as it's bloody cold when winter winter has been coming, and I didn't listen to the Starks, and now it's freezing. So we had a few pop culture references, um, or other things like the lounge is real warm and great, but every night I have to embark on the dangerous journey up the stairs to my bedroom. I would say it's the New Zealand equivalent of Mount Everest. Um, we also had and uh, no means of, um, you know, objectively measuring the temperature. So we asked whether they shiver indoors during the winter and we had, um, you know, 70% of them telling us that they shivered inside at least once during the winter. And um, I was kind of surprised that 40% of them were contributing to paying the bills, um, at least sometimes as well. And there was also um, half of them telling us that um, cold was restricting the rooms that they used, um, which, you know, had knock-on effects for privacy or homework and things like that, which were particularly important to young people. Um, some activities that they told us that were restricted by cold. Um, nearly half of them did say that their activities were unrestricted, but for those who it was affecting, it was a, it was a big problem. They said things like, I can't sleep if I'm not warm in bed at night. I feel as though I don't want to get up and do my homework, chores or jobs. I don't feel motivated to do anything other than sit in one place to keep warm. And they also said quite strongly um, that the cold affected their study. It wasn't so many um, young people that told us that being cold affected their study. I think it was only about 4%. But when they did, they said things like, it's too cold to do their homework, it's too cold to think, or they're stressed out that it's too cold in their room to do homework or study. Um, and just a quick note that we, we checked against um, ethnicity, the three different climate zones um, across the country for building standards. Um, the climate zone gave us no statistically significant differences, which we were surprised about, but we did find that Māori were at greatest risk of fuel poverty, and also if um, they were in rental occupant, if they were rental, private rental occupants and state-owned um, housing occupants, they were at greater risk as well. So, in summary, we found that fuel poverty was an important youth issue and it affected their school 
performance, their health and their mental health, and that they were very um, strong and vocal about the fact that they wanted more government action to address cold housing and fuel poverty. And the group that were involved in the research were also very keen to be involved in the dis dissemination. They wanted John Key to come to our presentation, which unfortunately didn't happen. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they, they want that conversation to be happening for young people. Um, and at the end of this project, one thing that I asked them was, okay, so what's your, what's your research priority? What would you like to investigate next relating to energy? And they said, Miss, I'm pretty sure that this classroom is not up to WHO standards. And so <laughs> and we were all wearing puffer jackets at this point. And it was the same, um, the same prefab that had been used when I was at the school. So, um, you know, it, it was a cold, cold room. It felt cold and they wanted to explore that. Um, and I just want to talk quickly about um, kind of levels of participation um, when working with children um, in research. And, and this is um, Hart's uh, ladder of participation and it, it goes through um, eight levels of participation that he talks about, eight rungs, where you start with non-participation at the bottom there, kind of manipulation, decoration and tokenism, where children are not really involved but they're, um, you know, sort of there. Um, and then the degrees of participation at, at the top of the ladder as you progress through. So um, I think we probably hit about rung six there where it was adult initiated, but we were having shared decisions with the children. Um, and parts of it were quite, um, were quite child directed as well. Um, you, you know, they did a lot of the, the work on the qualitative analysis particularly. Um, and they were involved heavily in the dissemination. They're actually um, co-authors, named as co-authors on the um, paper that we published in Social Science, Medicine and Population Health. Um, but I also want to show you this alternative structure that's been put forward by um, Christina Ergler um, at the University of Otago, which is um, that maybe, maybe participation doesn't go in that um, linear fashion up a ladder. Maybe that's not what what is needed because um, if we're thinking about what the children want to get out of it, then they want to go sideways, they want to go backwards, it's more like a jungle gym. Um, you know, they, they don't necessarily want to do all the parts of the participation and we're, maybe we've been looking at participation from a very adult viewpoint. Um, and that becomes important as we'll see later when we talk about how the children were involved for the school study. Um, and so when they said to us that their schools were cold, we had um, a quick look around and, um, you know, all the evidence that we could find suggested that, yes, schools are cold, but there's, there's not a lot of really, um, there's not a lot of research that has been done to date. Um, some, some has been done by um, Brands and Massey, um, particularly our colleague Mikhail Bullock in Auckland has been doing quite a lot of work, but not not a lot of work has been done. Um, but there is evidence that, um, you know, with the, the model of having schools responsible for their own building management and the budgets of how they do that, um, that hasn't maybe worked so well. There's problems with leaky building syndrome um, and there's been an estimate quite recently that 18% of the school building stock or 41% of the buildings require repair at the moment. So our research question for 2016 was do classrooms in the Horofanoa provide thermal comfort? So to do this, I actually went only one time to visit the next class in 2016. Um, and I explained to them what the problem was and how I thought that we should go about trying to measure this, that we would um, get some local schools that they could go to and they could install um, data loggers to, to measure temperature and relative humidity. And we also wanted to have um, a wee look at the um, CO2 levels because um, the work that Mikhail's done has really shown that, um, that the classrooms are extremely stuffy and because they're cold, nobody wants to open the windows, which is um, really detrimental potentially for their learning. Um, and when I, when I did that visit and I asked them how they wanted to be involved, they basically said, Miss, we've got this. Um, so <laughs> from that point, the data collection was entirely youth-led 
and then they returned um, that data to us or they shared it um, with us for us to do our own analysis and they used um, they wrote about their experiences for part of their um, their NZQA standards. So um, we did a pre-pilot in the summer um, and I think I'll hand over to Helen if she's happy to jump in here. Okay, thanks Kim. So the pre-pilot in the summer was before Kim had engaged with the school students and we were just put some data lot uh, partly in response to the school teacher saying in actual fact it was really hot in the classrooms in summer and that maybe we should be measuring that as well as winter and also because we were interested in knowing if say our data logs would stay up on the walls of the schoolrooms and not have sad and bad things happen to them we conducted a pilot over the a pre pilot over the summer which the loggers went in basically in february and came out middle late march um, the class teacher who um, of the class that Kim was involved in the previous year was the teacher that we were involved with again, and we got him to put up some loggers in his classroom that he identified as one of the worst in the school, and also in a variety of other classrooms that represented other building, a range of the other building types around the school. And I grabbed some outdoor temperature data from Palmerston North because it was the nearest place that had free outdoor temperature data on the web. So this all this is in the Homer Fenoa, it was basically all in the Levin area. This actually matters all. Is this during term? Yes, <laughs> yes, all the data I'm going to show is during term. Right. And all the data I'm going to show is during term during the school week. I've, okay. I've um, eliminated all the other bits. It wasn't empty buildings. So can, can you move us on? Yep. Okay, so this is um, a plot of what happened in summer. We've got the outdoor temperature in Palmerston North along the bottom, and the indoor temperature in the schoolrooms up the top. And this was data I just restricted to just during the school day in that uh, school. So from I think 8:50 a.m. to 3:10 p.m. or it might have been 8:40 to 3:10. And what these I've got lines that go across 18 and 20 degrees. That's because the Ministry of Education has similar guidelines for schools that say school classrooms should be 18 to 20 degrees. From this graph, my hypothesis is they would, didn't actually meet that very often. And we um, did get a range of school classrooms, but there's just not much going on there. Um, even at these big um, and the coolest times of day, the classrooms are routinely warmer than that. Um, can you move us on And this is looking at another way across the whole day. I've included a bit more data in this graph because you can use your eyes to edit out bits at the end. So what we have here is the minimum temperature looks that was experienced at that time of day during the weeks uh, that the loggers were in the classrooms. Then I've got the slight gray area is the 10th percentile. So the area between this and that had only 10% of the data in it. Uh, the dark gray is 25%, also the light gray to dark gray has about 15% of the data. The black line is the median, so about 25% of the data in this patch, and the end is going higher up green. So you can get a feeling for the variation across the school day of the temperatures that kids were exposed to in these rooms. And we can see basically the temperature started off Followed the guidelines at um, 9 a.m. and just kept on getting hotter. Um, reaching, uh, can you go back for a second? Sorry. Yeah, reaching some truly ridiculous temperatures in, in, in some of the classrooms by 3 p.m. So we've got about 35 degrees going on there at the maximum. Um, okay, now move on. But this, uh, that one graph uh, covers a shows a huge, covers a huge diversity of what actually went on in the different classrooms. We've got the 10 different classrooms we logged here, and the things sliding in this direction are temperatures that were colder than the MOE, MOE guidelines. The dark grey is actually met guidelines, and sliding in this direction is an increasing amount of exceeded guidelines. So this one block here is 
20 to 23 degrees, this one here, 23 to 26, and more than 26 degrees as the fitness, fitness lines at the top. So, so there's obviously a guidelines on the bottom, but also on the top. No, 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 I'm, I'm sitting on the top of this graph. This is the percent of time oh. that, so the room after the label was 10, spent about 5% of the school day, less than 18 degrees. Right. Maybe 15, 10 to 15% inside guidelines. A good 50% um, up to 3 degrees above 20, up to 23 degrees. 20%, um, 23 to 26 degrees and 15 percent more than 26 degrees. Yeah, just my question is, you know, we want them warm, but they can be too warm. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, the Ministry of Education guidelines are That's 18 better. to 20. That's the band of the customers. Okay, so anything about 20 is being too, too warm? Well, anything above 20 is higher than the guidelines. I'd, personally, my feeling is that might be a little bit low. Yeah. But um, it's... Um, since we don't have anything better now, I use the 18 to 20 as a um, mark than this. Personally, I'm, I'd be happy with up to about 23 or possibly 24, yeah. which is a reason that I uh, made that bottom category of um, rating and guidelines what it was. But I don't think anybody would think that this room here, which spent half the time between nearly half the time above 26 degrees is in any way appropriate for kids to be learning in. It's hard to... Oh, I thought you said it. You won't fail you. Um, can you move on to the next one, Kim? Uh, but uh, fact, I you know, showed a whole lot of diversity, and this is an example of the diversity of it. This is one of the rooms with the same kind of graph I showed you earlier. So we've got a room that kind of started off the day about 23 degrees with maybe a couple of degrees on either side of it and by the end of the day um, at 3 p.m. was maybe 24 degrees plus or minus a couple of degrees and you know it's above the guidelines but it's not awful that's quite a you know I would find that room quite pleasant to be in to tell you the truth even if it does breach MOE guidelines in contrast this was happened in one of the other classrooms it is. It's, um, I think this is the classroom that belonged to the teacher who was involved with the study. Right. And he actually used the, these numbers that we got to agitate for better conditions in their classroom. And they got heat pumps and stalls for cooling during the summer. Is that correct, Ken? Yeah, the students actually took the, um, the summer pre-pilot data to a board meeting. Um, and to their principal and said, look, we've now got proof that this prefab is terrible in the summer and we're also telling you that it's been awful every winter as well. And so they installed two heat pumps right then um, before we'd even done any of the winter measurements, which um, maybe not ideal from a research perspective, but from the public health perspective of having the children in the classroom for another winter, we didn't mind. Um, you know, it, the research was already serving its purpose for them. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, some of the three pilots, so uh, can you move on? So overall, this is just a description of the awfulnesses in a variety of ways. Um, only two classrooms were ever listed in the guidelines. Uh, nine of the classrooms were above 25 degrees for at least a quarter of the school day, and two were more than 30 degrees for more than 10% of the school day. I, find it, I can't give an editorial on that, I think the numbers speak for themselves. So, and then we were moving on to the winter and spring pilot, which uh, is the data, the things that uh, the Otago Energy Research Centre funded. Um, we planned data collection in Wairupehu and four primary intermediate schools over the late winter, basically term three. Um, unfortunately, measles happened in the Finn last winter, which um, altered the data collection significantly. Uh, what we did achieve was two weeks of measurement in Waiopehu College during late uh, term two, when we had the data loggers up in um, a fit of early enthusiasm because the teacher could put them up early. Uh, I asked for the loggers to go back into precisely the same rooms they were before. I thought that they went up there, but I'm not 100% certain, which is a problem with doing collaborative research with people who have other priorities. 
you know, I think they did it. I'm reasonably confident they did, but I don't know for certain. And we had very very lengths of time for the longest being up in the primary schools in spring. It was much later than we expected because of the measles. Um, so why, I mean, it was just people were away. Why, why, why did that? Uh, people were away, and when people, after they got back, the teachers were really keen to actually get them doing their classwork rather than doing the fun right, bits okay. of going to interview primary school kids. Right. Um, I think that's basically the story behind it. We had loggers in four schools, but working with enthusiastic teenagers who don't understand the importance of ancillary data, some of them forgot to actually write down when the loggers went into the schools and when they came out. I could make a pretty good guess from the temperature traces that were on the loggers, but we had data from 27 classrooms and three schools I was reasonably confident about, so I didn't bother. I thought to keep stick with the data that we knew was actually measuring school temperatures. So the loggers don't put the data on them? Oh yeah, they don't. They, uh, but I set them up so that they would start logging about a week after I sent them out from my office and they kept on logging until they returned. So they don't need the dates with each reading? Oh yeah, they don't. They don't. So but, you know what the dates that they were. But I don't know the date that the students put them into the schools. Oh, so I'm asking, do they not have a date? When the recording comes back, the dates don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each day doesn't have this recording with that date. Oh yes, it does entirely, and that's what I've used for you know the time right. stamping data I did earlier. I don't understand your problem. Okay, and the problem is I sent the loggers to Waikato College, mm -hmm. and sometime after I sent them there, the students put them into the schools. Oh, so they're away for a bunch of time taking all these readings in different settings, and you're not going to understand when they were where. I can guess, but I don't always know. So we don't actually. Doesn't know when they were actually put in the classroom. Okay. Yeah. They might have been sitting in an office for, for a couple of days. Well, uh, from what I mean, we know that they weren't in place for quite a long time because of the measles outbreak and the effect right. on the classrooms. Um, so some of them I know more than others, mm -hmm. but I've inspected the data I'm going to show you to those entities. Well, sure about. Take that would have worked. Yes, I I gave them a sheet of paper to write it down on, but maybe a photo on the phone yeah, would have worked yeah. better. Mm -hmm. What was the exact role of you, like, in the graphing and stuff? What was the oh. young people just putting in the logs into the classroom for the little boxes yeah. that they all they did? Them? That's what they did with us. They also conducted workshops with the kids in the classrooms to talk about the They, As Kim said, they did more of the qualitative work than the quantitative work in this bit. In 2015... So this is... Sorry, this relates to the first study. This is a follow-up to the first study. Yes. This is a follow-up because um, they said they were concerned about their classroom environment and it seemed a good thing to follow up on. So it was really student-led? Yes, really and um, being student-led... They gave you the idea, basically. Well, they gave the idea and we followed up with some of the data collection and they did a great deal of... They did the qualitative data collection and analysis. Um, oh, sorry. Um, kind of a, was it a social studies class or something? What, what was their... Kim? Yeah, so um, the first year they were a year 10 social studies class. Um, basically, the school that um, Waipahe College basically streams their, their classes and they gave us their um, a high performing academic class that they asked us to work with. Um, so, you know, the students were very keen from the beginning and um, there were some some very switched on um, kids in there that certainly added a lot of value to the research from my perspective. Um, and then in this, the second year, it was not a year 10 class. It was, um, it was actually a school, uh, you know, the NCEA level one class. Um, and it was a, a social sciences type um, class. Um, and Part of my motivation there was because um, the students described this class to me as being a bit of a cabbage subject. <laughs> so I wanted to show them that actually social science is not a cabbage subject um, and that, you know, they could do something important with this. And the, the unit standard that they were working towards was about um, a social action, that they had to perform some kind of a social action. Um, so I think... 
the probably the social action unit that would have got the most airtime over the last year would have been um, the girls that did the work about um, sanitary pads in schools and um, funding for that. And so it was a similar kind of thing. They had to pick a topic that was um, of importance in their community and then they had to show that they were actively engaging with this. So they showed this by um, writing their reports and saying, you know, we're working with the University of Otago and that we wanted to measure classroom temperature and we've done all the data collection for that. And then most of the stuff that they wrote in their reports was about the qualitative workshops that they held. Um, yeah. So they weren't the same young people from the first year and second year? Or some of like them were, because some of them had elected to go, and be, but because this is um, NCEA level one, so then they, they get to choose some of their subjects. And so this was an elective subject to choose. Yeah, so I think we had about um, one third of the class would have been um, kids from the previous year, year, but some of them were new. Um, so that did kind of make a difference in terms of the, um, I guess, the who was driving the quality of the data collection as well, because the, the youth researchers from the previous year um, you know, they, they really learn a lot about um, how to do research. So when I went back in to the second year and said, you know, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? They pretty much um, had good ideas and they wanted me to back right off in terms of um, my involvement in, in the driving of it. it. This project was very much, um, you know, it was more like the very top of that Roger Hart ladder in, the, in terms of who designed it and what they did. I suggested what they should do um, for um, the, the quantitative data analysis and measurement. They, they had no problems with that. They were quite happy to go ahead and, um, and to use the, the temperature buttons. Um, and for the qualitative workshops, I suggested that they try using a Goldilocks type analogy, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute, but that's what they went with. But then they developed their own workshops. I wasn't involved in how to do the qualitative workshops. Did you give them training on interviewing and stuff? Sorry? Did you give them training like mm -hmm. in the workshops and stuff like, because they were working with primary, intermediate, and secondary, were they, did they have like, um, did you sort of teach them how to facilitate the workshops? Um, yeah, I mean, we that was that was what we mostly talked about when um, when I spoke with them. It was how were they going to do these workshops, and they some of them were really unconvinced that they were going to be able to talk to because they they would have little control over which classrooms the primary schools put forward. Um, so they were worried about talking to five-year-olds versus talking to 12-year-olds, for example. And that's why I said to them, look, I think you should go with a Goldilocks analogy, you know, is a classroom too hot, too cold, or just right? And if you frame it around that, then even the very, very little ones are going to understand it. And the older ones, you know, as long as they get on board and they don't think it's too lame and don't want to participate at all, they will also understand what you're talking about. So um, that was my suggestion to them. And then they spent most of their um, classroom unit time, they spent working on how to do these workshops, what they were going to do, how they were going to talk to the kids, you know, kind of practicing the activities that they wanted to do with their classroom teacher. Um, so, you know, I guess his experience as a teacher, um, I imagine drove a bit of this as well, but um, but I th I think that he also stepped back and let them drive it mostly and um, what they wanted to do. You know, I asked them what equipment they needed from me, and they wrote back. First, they wrote back and said they needed a beer suit, and then, <laughs> then they revised that and said no, they didn't need that. All they needed was um, stuff for making. Um, hot chocolates so that they could, you know, make a hot chocolate that was too cold, make one that was um, too hot, and then, and then you know, add the milk and, and it would be just right. And that's what they were going to use both as an incentive to participate and um, to kind of demonstrate another way. So they, they came up with a series of activities about too cold, too hot, and just right. 
Okay, can you move us on, Kim? Mm -hmm. So this is um, a similar data for winter in the high school. You can see that we're inside the MOE, MOE guidelines sometimes, but pretty much at random to my mind. Uh, and even the very coldest hit, um, outdoor temperatures, so these were temperatures I took out in the schools, uh, with a dog locker outside the school itself. Um, there were some classrooms with acceptable temperatures. There were also some temperatures that really weren't acceptable, down to about 14 degrees. Hard to imagine anybody concentrating at that kind of temperature. Okay, can we move on again? And this is a similar thing showing average temperatures over um, the main temperatures over the school day. So call this at the beginning of the morning, who would have thought? Warms up a bit um, to about midday onward. Knees will be started, and then at the close at the end of the school day, right, temperature gradually decreases. Pretty much what you'd expect. And the highest temperature was only about 26 degrees, so not as nearly as stuffy as summer, but again, that's what you'd expect. But again, this adds a huge amount of diversity. You move this on, Tim. I apologize for the colors on this. Uh, in this graph, uh, the green is the same as the uh, gray on the earlier graph I showed you with the range of temperatures. The blue are increasingly cold, yellow, orange, and red is increasingly warm. So we can see we've got one classroom that was pretty much inside the guidelines most of the time, but others that were out too cold 75% of the time or nominally too warm, but actually only up to 25 degrees, so probably pleasant. This is um, all in the same school? Well, this is all in uh, the it's college very again. Hmm? Well, very after good. they put the heat pump in? Yes. When they just turn the heat pump on the building? I cannot answer this question. This is the temperatures as experienced by the kids. They might have, um, or they might have, um, I don't know which rooms these loggers were in, like I said. Mm -hmm. It could be that this was a heat pump room, which, um, Enjoyed being greater than 20 degrees. I enjoyed There's nothing being. wrong with 20 degrees. No. That's, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's my feeling. Worrying one into the right hand side, yeah. Yeah. And also, to some extent, even SO, when I'm labeled SO3, because you've got it's a greater than 25 degrees for about a third of the school day. That's getting a bit stuffy. And also, with these temperatures, what we don't know from this is how stuffy the room is and how much air changes going on and what they're doing in order to keep the room at that temperature. But yeah, fairly brutal. Uh, and can you move us on again? And again, uh, this is a picture of a room that I thought was actually would be quite pleasant to be in. 9 a.m. was about 20 degrees, which was slowly over the morning and stayed about 23 or 24 for the school day. There was a bit of variation, but again, two or three degrees. That looked quite pleasant to me. But the next one, it's hard to imagine kids being able to concentrate properly in this um, kind of environment. And uh, I mean, maximum temperature 30 degrees, and that's not achieved until about um, one in the afternoon. So all morning, just miserable. It took to about midday, the mean median temperature to reach 18. Yeah, and, and this is a high school, so it's all pretty things. Um, some of them are, but not all of them. I think some of the, uh, like I said, I asked them for them to go into diversity of rooms around the school. Um, it's hard to imagine there'd be such diversity when, you know, it's not we have those oil meters in schools, only that central easing and a block where you'd imagine that, that all the rooms would be the same at least you had a really study room like this. Yeah, I, I asked, I get, there was general protocols for where you put a data logger up, so I told them somewhere that's not just above a heater, somewhere that doesn't get the sun on it, preferably not on an outside wall, and somewhere that's exposed to the temperature in the room itself, and we didn't have control over this. We had to ask for it and hope that it happened. I, I can um, just comment on the room that I worked in, um, which is um, Dan, our teacher's room, and um, and when I went in, I said to them in the winter, so, you know, you want to put it kind of um, maybe a, a little bit lower than what a light switch is so that it's, you know, it's, it's um, 
a bit higher than the level of your heads when you're sitting down. Um, and, you know, it needed to be away from sunlight and blah, blah, blah. And maybe if the teacher's got a, a desk in a corner, then maybe that would be a, a good spot. And I turned around and they had the data logger stuck to the wall exactly where I would have suggested that they put it. So um, it's maybe not an indication for all the rooms, but I, I, they'd done a really great job in that room of picking the exact same spot that I would have picked. Um, so yeah, I can only hope that they did such a good job in the other rooms as well. And um, the kids, because it's, this was a high school also, the kids would be moving between multiple rooms during the day. So in some ways, this, although it's awful, you can at least think they wouldn't have been cold all day. Not true, of course, for the teacher who probably gets to stay in the same room all day and freeze, but you know, some of the time they'll be boiling in the <laughs> yeah. 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 Can you move us on here? So this is just a description of what we've seen there. Uh, since we're time's moving on, yeah. I think you've all looked at the graphs. So move us on to the next bit. Oh yeah. Pictures of um have the impact of closing the school on um hitting the national media because of the measles. And so this is the reason that the kids didn't get into the primary schools for weeks after they have got that data from the um, high school itself. Can move us on? So this is our data from the primary schools, uh, primary and intermediate. And uh, you can see we've actually got some colder temperature, external temperatures going on, and we had them in the high school. And again, Sometimes school rules meet MOE guidelines, but it doesn't look like there's much effort being made to actually control the temperatures to inside that those levels at all. And also some pretty high temperatures that go on sometimes. What we can see is that there's not very much effect of external temperature on internal temperature except for the really low temperatures. So um, whatever control was happening was happening from about seven degrees on up. And um, again, Ken. Um, looking, this is um, sensitive because that's just how the data that they ended up using. Really quite cold at the start of the day. Um, some of the rooms down to about 10 degrees, um, other up to about 25. Huge variation going on here. Um, and, but warming up in the morning and then these constant ish median during the afternoon. So we must have reached some kind of steady state possibly, but huge variability. And these are of course primary school classrooms where kids don't get to move between different classrooms so much during the day. So a kid in one of these rooms is likely to be stuck in that for the day. So can you move on to our radiation slides? Um, Again, huge variability. We've uh, labeled the three schools by uh, letter. So this all the ones fill into this onto one school. This is a mother and this is the third. So huge variation both within and between schools. Consistent variation within schools. I mean, you know, they're consistently consistently variable, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um I believe most of these were actually in the kids' classrooms rather than school halls and so on that, again, weren't always given sufficient information. But even if it's in a school hall, yeah. some of these temperatures, it, this one spent 8% of the day um, below 18 degrees or thereabouts. Yeah, and on. Um, this um, started off cold. This is just one room again. So, talk to the 1 pm for the median temperature to get to 18 degrees. Yeah, just unpleasant. And, and this one, um, huge variability in this one. I suspect this is one of the, I'm pretty sure it's one of the ones that was up for the shortest amount of time which is why the data was more jagged. But it warmed up quite fast in the morning and then was over MOE guidelines most of the day, but 
to my mind, might have been reasonably pleasant if it wasn't too stuffy. But that's because I like being warmer than the MOE says kids need to be. Um, so, um, keeping in, that in mind, can you move us on again? Okay, that's just what we've discussed, and again. Um, the yeah, typical classroom um, spent over half the school day outside of the guidelines. The worst classroom, nearly five hours outside the guidelines. The best one was only outside the guidelines for one hour a day, which is still a fifth, a sixth of the school day. And assuming the guidelines are adequate, which we can only hope they'll respect the two com. Uh, now, as part of the work funder, we also got a CO2 monitor. And it spent most of its time, I suspect, in Dan's room. So uh, what we can, this is a data from just over a week, which I've expanded out. So this is carbon dioxide level, averaging of a baseline of about 450 ppm, um, peaking regularly on each school day to over 1,000 ppm. Um, workplace guidelines give a bad maximum thing, or an average thing that should be exceeded in the workplace is about 5,000 ppm, so this is well below that. But there's increasing evidence uh, that having levels as low as six or 800 might have bad effect on people's executive functioning, with interesting arguments for what climate change and increased levels of CO2 overall might have on uh, people's ability to think their way out of problems. But as it, if we're wanting kids to have good problem-solving abilities and learn to solve problems, having high levels in your school classrooms routinely at 800 ppm doesn't seem smart. So, but the guidelines aren't quite that. Uh, no, the MOE doesn't have in, indoor environment guidelines. That, that was a adult workplace guideline. Right. For, I think, for carbon dioxide. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was for. I think it's basically workplace exposure to. You're saying there are studies that are above 600. Yeah. Them, yes. For children or just for uh, I think that was for, probably for young adults because that's the um, group that is usually most studied overall and likes doing studies at university environment chambers. I, I, yeah, precisely. <laughs> Um, and what you can see here is um, pretty regularly um, we have a dive in the middle of the day. I'm assuming that's due to the lunch hour. Right. So it's, if the rooms are ventilated, then it goes down. And the, it being this high will be an effect of the rooms being poorly ventilated to try and keep the temperature on, would be my guess. This is all a pilot study. And what we've done is um, use some of the data to um, uh, put in applications for the NHRC grant to look at indoor environment in a lot more detail in schools. Okay, and that is, I think, Kim. Um, okay, so yeah, I, I talked mostly about this before. I just wanted to mention the qualitative workshops that um, the um, Year 11s did with the primary school children. So they did use the Goldilocks idea. Um, and they had a range of activities that they came up with, like a quiz, and um, they or they had this interesting activity where they um, they made a kind of um, like it was like a buzzer quiz where they had one person that they put their feet in a bucket of ice and put ice packs all over them, and then they got other another person got to be the the too hot person, so they bundled them up in a hundred jackets and a whole bunch of hot water bottles and things. And the idea was that they were trying to they were hoping that the middle person who was just the same and was just right would um would get the most questions right <laughs> i mean some of these things were um i guess fairly unscientific but they demonstrated their point so that when they um were talking to the children um about what their classrooms were like um they they did get some quite good data and they particularly one activity that they did after their sort of intro and their fun games and things was about um is your classroom too hot, too cold, or just right? And um, is is your classroom too noisy, too quiet, or just right? And is your classroom too stuffy, or too drafty, or just right? And so they used a range of these um, indoor environmental quality indicators that we're hoping to study um, further. 
Um, and just a few qualitative results that I've pulled about how it is for children when it is cold. Um, mm -hmm. They said things like, I feel like I'm getting a cold, but I'm at school, not with my mum and dad. Um, and they said, it makes it too hard to learn because it's too cold. And you can't concentrate properly because you're only concentrating on you want to be warm or something. Um, and I, I would say that the average age of the children that they spoke to was probably about seven or eight. Um, but again, uh, like I really had very little, um, I had no, no input into what the questions were that they were asking um, children. I, I saw videos, so I've got... Um, video, some videos that the class took um, kind of as part of their evidence portfolio for what they've done for their NZQA. So that's how I've got this, these qualitative results. Um, so just uh, in conclusion of our pilot study, we've, um, we've there's some things that we can say, even given um, some of the limitations around our data quality is that environmental monitoring shows that winter classroom temperatures are outside of Ministry of Education guidelines um, and that the qualitative data found that the children were uncomfortable and they believe that their learning and health is affected, is affected by it. Um, they did also ask in some of the schools what the teachers thought and the, the teachers also agreed that um, the, the classrooms were uncomfortable and that learning and health was affected. Um, and just, yeah, a big... A big um, I guess tick for doing participatory research um, because we've found that using participatory um, methods with youth um, does work for helping to monitor indoor temperature in classrooms and to explore classroom comfort among children and like Helen said we do have further investigation planned for hopefully a big HRC um, project and it will be working with our colleague um, Mikhail Bullock who's very into the CO2 um, and other um, environmental indicators as well in classrooms and has done quite a bit of work the last couple of years trying to build up some more evidence about that um, as well as temperature um, and thank you for your attention and if you want to get in touch with either Helen or I about this um, and also to take a look at our website, there's a bit of information mostly about the first study there. Thank you. Cool.